Rebuilding a Stuart Models Twin Launch Model Steam Engine and this is part 10, Machining the Crankwebs. The previous video showed me cutting these crankwebs out of a piece of steel bar. This video shows me machining them and the third video about making the crankshaft coming next is how to put it all together and make it work. This clip shows me cleaning the thread of an old forge or chuck that fits my Boxford lathe. I thought I would do this job on the smaller of my two lathes because it's closer to the size that you would commonly find in model engineering workshops. My other lathe is much bigger than this one. What I'm doing at the moment in this clip is removing the three jaw chuck and a very quick health and safety warning that is actually a sensible one. Whenever you're doing a job like this, removing a chuck from a lathe, please, please, please remember to remove the tool from the tool post because a sharp cutting tool sticking out the tool post will eventually stick in your hand. I do speak from experience. Now that this three jaw chuck has been removed from the headstock, you can clearly see how much swarf gets into the threads of the chuck once it's been removed. And in this particular part of the clip, it shows me accidentally brushing some swarf from the cross slide into the chuck. So normally, I wouldn't clean the chuck up at this point, but for the video I am doing, I would only clean the threads like you've just seen me do with the four jaw chuck when I was about to refit the chuck to the headstock spindle. And this is the headstock spindle, and I'm cleaning this at the moment with a paintbrush. It's very important to get every trace of swarf away from this piece of equipment. If any pieces of swarf are left behind on these threads, two things can happen. One is it may affect the accuracy of the chuck, and it could also, over a period of time, damage the threads. So I apply some lubrication, and it's now time to fit the newly cleaned four jaw chuck onto the thread. And as you can see, it goes on very easily, but firmly. It is vital in every way to make sure that the chuck that you're attaching to your lathe is tight and securely. And to facilitate this on the old Boxford, there's a button which locks the spindle. It's not anything ultra clever. This button just presses on a piece of metal that goes into a hole in the spindle and locks it in position. And that allows you to put a bar in the chuck, as I'm doing at the moment, and just nip the chuck onto the register. As I've never used this four jaw chuck before, I think I've lost the key or never had the key that tightened the jaws. So I'm having to improvise by using a socket extension bar, which is okay but not ideal. I've had a few comments, in fact I've had a lot of comments lately. Some good, some bad, some really stupid, but I won't go into that. That's just a bit of entertainment for me. And some of the comments are about lubricating oils suitable for model steam engines. I always add this stuff to my lubricating oil. This is cold pressed rapeseed oil. And one man commented, we don't call this stuff rapeseed because it's too rapey, whatever that means. We call it canola oil. Maybe I'll start calling this looting and pillaging oil. This is steam cylinder oil. Nothing suspicious about this. It's very thick and gloopy, almost like treacle. And I bought this in 2006 and it's got my name on it. And as far as I'm aware, I don't think there's a sell-by date on steam cylinder oil. The mixture I would normally use for general lubrication of both steam cylinders and steam engine moving parts like bearings, only on small engines of course because they all get hot, are as follows. Steam cylinder oil, 60%. And as you see here, light machine oil would be 20% of the mixture, and the other 20% would be cold pressed rapeseed oil that you can buy from the supermarket and it's very cheap. That's enough talk about oil. It's time now to mark out the crankwebs. So I'm cleaning up just one of them on a piece of wet or dry sandpaper. And then I painted the piece that I cleaned up on the wet or dry sandpaper. I just sprayed it with some black aerosol. I know that proper engineers should use that blue stuff for marking out, but I don't have any of that. But I have plenty of part-filled aerosol cans of black paint. What I'm doing at the moment is using a spring-loaded centre punch to put a mark on one edge only of the crankweb blanks. The reason for this will become apparent later on in the video. In the previous episode of this series, I mentioned about the throw of the crank pins, and this was not shown on the drawing, so how could you know what the throw needs to be for this engine? And the answer is simple if you know the stroke of the engine. And the stroke of this engine is 7 eighths of an inch. And this 7 eighths of an inch is the distance that the piston travels 
from the bottom to the top of the cylinder, or from the top to the bottom of the cylinder, whichever way you look at it. And for anyone who's completely clueless where fractions are concerned, as I've just mentioned, the stroke of the engine is 7 eighths of an inch. So half of that, which is the throw of the crank pins, would be 7 sixteenths. Half of 7 sixteenths is 7 thirty seconds, and so on and so forth. So in actual fact, there are two ways to find out what the throw of the crank pins are. One is to find the stroke of the engine, in this case from Stuart Model's website, and it's 7 eighths of an inch, as I've just mentioned, and the other way to find out the distance between the centres of the crank pin and the crankshaft itself is just to measure the drawing, because the drawing is one-to-one -one scale. Some of the comments about this on the channel were getting a bit out of order, and in the end I had to delete some of them. What I'm doing at the moment is marking out this piece of metal, and I'm doing this very clumsily on purpose. I'm making the lines much thicker than they need to be, just so you can see them. And it's just for the purposes of the video. I'm saying this, but I better get some stupid comments. It's worth remembering, though, that all comments come through me. You comment on the channel, it doesn't get on the channel unless I allow it on there. And I never allow comments on religion or politics or anything containing a link. Once I drilled the pilot holes with the centre drill, I cleaned off the black paint. And this is what I'm left with. And when I check the centre dimensions, they are exactly 7 sixteenths of an inch. So that's OK. There are many different ways to do this job. When I first started making these videos, my idea was to make videos for people who needed the information. Not for experts, not to be clever, just to show beginners the simplest method by which they could manufacture parts to make a miniature steam engine. Or, as is often the case, repair a miniature steam engine. By sticking all of these pieces of metal together and squaring them up with two pieces of steel, I could then clamp the parts together, clean them up on the linisher to make sure they were fully in line, and then use spring clamps to hold them together until the Loctite 603 had set. One viewer wrote in and said, why did he use spring clamps? Why couldn't he use clothes pegs? Or washing pegs as he called them. Well, you can use clothes pegs, but they don't have the benefits of these really nice swivelling jaws that hold things square. And it's also far easier to clamp things to my action man's head using these than clothes pegs, which may damage his ears. Over now to the lathe operations. One problem I have with this Boxford is it's very difficult to get the camera in to film some of the operations. It's in the right hand corner of my workshop, and things are a little bit cramped around there. I actually find this part of the video quite difficult to explain. Suffice to say, I'm fitting the block, which of course is made up of the four metal parts, which are the crank webs, into the four jaw chuck, and I'm lightly clamping it in place. And by adjusting the movable jaws, I can make it so that this piece spins in the four jaw chuck and is exactly in line with the centre drill in the tailstock. Here comes the centre drill, and as you can see, it's miles away at the moment, and I will only actually start the drilling process. Once the tip of the centre drill goes into one of these holes without binding in any way. It is of course very important to make sure that you're using a lathe with an accurate tailstock. If the tailstock is not adjusted correctly or is out of alignment, this is not going to work. But in this case, my old Boxford is quite accurate, so I don't have that problem. Working with a four jaw chuck is an entirely different principle to a three jaw chuck. With a three jaw chuck, you put your piece of bar or hexagon in the chuck and tighten the jaws. With a four jaw chuck, it's a four way system. It makes it much easier to see what's happening if I speed up the video. As you can see, I'm carefully moving the jaws independently of each other on sides opposite to each other to move the piece of metal into the right position so that the centre goes into the hole without being impeded in any way. And these days, I need a magnifying glass. My eyes ain't what they used to be. Eventually, I get it absolutely spot on. The tip of the centre drill goes into the hole that I drilled on the drilling machine, and now I can drill a proper centre on the work to guide the main twist drill. And this twist drill is one imperial size under 5 sixteenths. Then I use a 5 sixteenths reamer, with the lathe running at a low speed, to finally size the hole. The next step is to move the block to the other side, and in exactly the same way as I've just shown, first of all a centre drill, then a twist drill, then a reamer. 
and I end up with a metal block that is a perfect fit for two 5 sixteenths of an inch diameter pieces of silver steel. But of course it's not much good having the crank webs in a block, so now I need to separate them. And all I do to make that happen is just heat the part up with a blow lamp. You don't need to apply too much heat for this to happen, just enough to break the Loctite bond. I don't actually know what temperature that would be, but it's not a lot. And one by one you can separate the pieces. This is the first piece, and round the back I'm putting it into a pot of water. This quenches it, just to stop me burning my fingers. A bit more heat, put with the screwdriver, maybe a bit of a tap, and the next piece comes away. And that too goes into my little pot of water to quench it. This has nothing to do with hardening the metal by the way, this is just mild steel. After separating the final two pieces and quenching them in the water, it's time to clean them up on a piece of sandpaper. This is the usual 400 wet or dry paper. Earlier on in this episode I used a centre punch to make some marks on one end of each of these pieces of metal that make up the crank webs. By making a mark on just one end of each of the pieces of metal, I know which bit goes where to keep the accurate alignment from the machining process. The fit of the silver steel in the reamed holes is just about right. There is enough clearance to allow the Loctite to penetrate the joint. The Loctite cannot do its job if it doesn't have any room to do its job. So always bear this in mind, and that doesn't mean you can make it a rattle fit, that's no good. The best way to describe it would be a snug fit, not an interference fit. That's about it for this episode. The next one will show the final assembly and the fitting of the crankshaft into the main bearings. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.